Trump wanted to get along with China to the extent where he's actually just recently he he uh, said that uh, during his uh, first term that he considered Pre Chinese President Xi Jinping as a very good friend. Uh, he made the weird statement that he, that they were in love, which is kind of you know that's always been a that's something he used with Kim Jong Un as well. Um, but just trying to focus that you know the fact that he uh, he wants to have good relations. He described President Xi as a great a great man. Um, I don't agree with any of those statements, uh, but I, I I admire Trump uh, for supporting peace. I'd rather have him talking, you know, good about enemy leaders and not giving up anything in terms of from uh, American national security interests, of course, uh, but rather to have, you know, peaceful coexistence, which uh, served us so well during the Cold War. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today we will do an update with a guest who hasn't been on the show for uh, over a year, I think. Yeah, over a year by now. I'm talking again to David Pine, who is a former U.S. Army Combat Arms and Headquarters staff officer in charge, who was in charge of armaments cooperation with the former Soviet Union and other regions. He currently serves as Deputy Director of National Operations for the Task Force on National and Homeland Security. David also publishes a successful and well-maintained substack called The Real War, on which he analyzes international affairs and U.S. national politics. Considering that President Biden just announced that after all, and after for many weeks saying I'm going to stay put, now finally made way for probably Kamala Harris to become the nominee for the, uh, the next presidency, and that Donald Trump survived a, an assassination attempt, and that now we basically have four or five months ahead of us when, you know, politics is anyone's guess. I think a situation like this we've never seen. We have a lot to discuss. So welcome back, David. Thanks so much for having me back on the show. Um, David, let's start with what you've seen last week, because you were at the um, Republican National Convention, the RNC, right, which is a almost a week long or at least four or five days long uh, event. And Donald Trump was officially made uh, candidate and uh, and he nominated J.D. Vance as his vice president. How was it? What did you see? How was the mood on the ground? Well, it was really exciting, you know, and, and one of the, the things that I want to want to emphasize is that there was no sign of anger at, at Trump being shot. There was no kind of no vengeful, vengeful attitudes. Of course, you know, uh, you know, there was criticism, of course, of, of the Biden Harris uh, government here in the U.S. Um, and the lawfare, of course, uh, where they've been trying to throw uh, Trump in prison, uh, you know, Biden has been um, much more authoritarian than any any president we've had, perhaps since FDR. Uh, but it was it was very it was very exciting. Uh, the mood was mood was light. It was uh, you know optimistic and and uh, unifying. Um, I didn't see any any signs of any racists or extremists or anything like that that the Democrats you know claim are part of the Republican coalition. Uh, so uh, and it was it was very multiracial. Uh, you know, for anyone that watched it, there were quite a, a very large percentage of African Americans, some Hispanics, Asians. So uh, this is a multiracial coalition. It's a coalition uh, for peace. The Republican Party, which was once the War Party during, uh, you know, my younger years during the Bush years, is is now the the Peace Party, and it's it's a it's a peace party that is uh, it's a center right party. I wouldn't say it's a conservative party it's at more of a center right coalition uh that welcomes in people of all political persuasions and uh president trump really did a good job of driving that point home he gave up all his petty attacks you know his his uh his kind of uh, uh juvenile monikers you know calling trump uh biden crooked joe and all those things he said that's all in the past we're not going to talk about that we're going to call them by their names and that's it and we're going to, you know, try to try to be above board. And I think he's done a pretty good job of that. But he, he did a really excellent job of that at the convention. And, you know, being shot, I, I think he was shot. Be, uh, he was uh, I think the assassin was likely in league with people in the in the deep state that wanted to silence uh, President Trump because he stands for peace, for peace with Russia in particular. 
you might uh, you might know that uh, JFK, or it's been said that JFK was assassinated by the CIA, CIA for wanting peace with the Soviet Union. I think that's likely true. I think that was the main reason that he was he was shot. He uh, engaged in the first arms control agreements with the Soviets. He um, he gave up, you know, he gave up more uh, with the, the, you know, in settling the Cuban Missile Crisis than he got back. Uh, although that wasn't public at the time, you know, he he gave up, uh, you know, kind of gave up the Monroe Doctrine, which was a core principle of uh, U.S. foreign policy, really the core for foreign policy principle, in which he promised never to invade Cuba, uh, which was under remained under communist control and and uh, remains that way today. Uh, he also, uh, you know pulled out uh, nuclear missiles from both uh, Turkey and Italy. And in return, the Soviets pulled most of their missiles out in Cuba and then later pulled them all out uh, a year or two later. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good parallel. I mean, JFK is actually somebody who understood, at least the Cuba Missile Crisis drove this home, that there are limits to uh, even a superpower and that the interests of the other party actually need to be considered in order to have some sort of stable agreement. Is it fair to say that Donald Trump is much closer to that kind of thinking now than the neocons, Joe Biden and the neocons around him, especially Jake Sullivan and Blinken and so on, have ever been? Because the one thing, the most frustrating thing for me as, a, as an outsider and foreigner is that these people seem to be so dead set on shoving their view of the world down the throat, even of the Russians, <laughs> even of the Russians. And that gets very dangerous. Do you think Donald Trump acts, uh, and the people around him now, although that's a big question, who will he select for his cabinet? But if you look at the RNC and how the RNC was kind of, uh, the, uh, sorry, not the RNC, the, Republic, the Republican Party, how the Republican Party was shifted rather towards you know, J.D. Vance and how uh, Mitch McConnell lost power. Do you think that this supports um, a more realistic view of, of uh, global power balance? It absolutely does. You know, it was in 2016 that, uh, you know, Trump took over the Republican Party from the neoconservatives, the Bush neoconservatives that have been dominant for uh, 16 years, essentially. And, um, you know, in picking J.D. J.D. Vance, he doubled he doubled down on his whole uh, you know peace with Russia approach. You know, uh, J.D. Vance, of course, has been a staunch opponent of aid to Ukraine, realizing that it's U.S. aid more than anything else that's caused that's prolonging the war and that has caused the deaths uh, or you know wounding of uh, a million Ukrainians to date. Uh, that's really done nothing, you know, but caused the death and destruction in Ukraine. Uh, you know, where they've lost. 30% of their population, mostly refugees, um, and, uh, you know, 30% of their uh, GDP, and then, of course, uh, 18 or 19% of their territory. When all of this could have been settled with the Istanbul Agreement, um, you know, where the Russians committed to withdraw their troops uh, from pre-war Ukrainian-controlled territory, and even before that was simply a, a piece of paper, uh, which was a, would be a written guarantee that Ukraine would never join NATO, signed by the president. So that could have been done at no cost. Uh, this whole, whole mess could have been avoided. J.D. Vance understands that. Trump understands that. Trump is committed to ending the war in 24 hours. Uh, but the J.D. Vance pick really is the most uh, is the most notable, um, uh, you know, kind of change because you know he had Mike Pence as his vice president before. Vice, you know, Mike Pence is very extreme neo neoconservative war monitor. He he uh, gave a speech to uh, the military academy in which he. He uh, informed the, the cadets that uh, they would soon be fighting Russia, Russia, China, and Iran. So he he ex he expected and perhaps intended as president to send them to war to fight all three three of those countries. Uh, had a very apocalyptic viewpoint, uh, not at all shy about World War Three. Uh, Trump really, I mean, of all, all the things in terms of his foreign policy. Uh, Probably the number one goal he has is avoiding World War III. So a lot of people, uh, you know, believe that uh, Trump uh, would be strong against, you know, be a hawkish against China. I don't believe that's the case. I think he's given every indication that he would not defend Taiwan militarily. I don't think he would announce that ahead of time. And so there could be some confusion on China's part, which could be dangerous because they, if indeed they they uh, are planning to attack Taiwan, they could potentially. Uh, attack us uh, preemptively. 
I don't think that, that they would do that, but it's possible. Uh, but I think Trump would keep us out of war with China, keep us out of a direct war with Russia. Again, uh, resolving the, the war in Ukraine, uh, the first, if not the first day, the first week of his presidency, assuming he has good advisors. Uh, and I've, I've uh, kind of laid out a, a peace plan uh, just in the last uh, week or two, which which ad, kind of provides a roadmap how we could end the war uh, in just a day or a week. So I'm very hopeful that he would do that. He's even spoken out against Netanyahu, say, not Netanyahu, uh, of course, Prime Minister of Israel, in stating that he's uh, he's made you know made some major mistakes with the war in Gaza and, and lost really uh, it, a lot of international support for Israel. Um, have you seen any signs that the Trump um, the Trump team that this is already forming because we are in a very special situation? I think I. I don't know of any moment when a sitting president who originally <laughs> wanted and was already basically nominated to be the candidate for the next term then was basically forced out. And this kind of chaos, this is transitional chaos now, whoever is it's going to be. But this is, this is a transitional chaos period. So do you think the Trump team is already planning with that? Because it's going to be very dangerous uh, if... Uh, President Biden remains president of the U.S. while Kamala Harris becomes the front runner uh, because this basically unchains all of the warmongering idiots in the cabinet to do whatever they want because they will not be the ones who will have to pick up the pieces. Right? I mean, this is going to be super dangerous. Um, how do you how do you make sense of the current situation and how do you think the Trump team will work on that? Well, I think you're absolutely right. And there's not much the Trump team can do, of course. You know, we're the party out of power. Uh, we have control of the House, but only barely. And our, uh, the House Speaker is in, uh, has been in league with the Democrats on Ukraine. So he's a neocon imperialist uh, as well. Uh, so really, uh, you know, Trump and J.D. Vance are, you know, uh, the only powerful voices within the Republican Party that, you know, that have power uh, as a counterweight to, uh, to the Biden-Harris regime. Uh, that are speaking out against uh, all these war monetary policies. So you're absolutely right. I, I share your fears. I think it's uh, America is entering a, um, a very dangerous period in which uh, Biden, of course, is a lame duck, can do whatever he wants, essentially, without, you know, short of assassinating Trump, which I, I hesitate to say he might have already attempted to do. Um and of course, putting him in jail, which he still might do, uh, because in September 18th, there is a sentencing hearing for Trump that could end in in uh, Trump being sent to Riker Island prison, which is no notoriously violent. Uh, a lot of the inmates get murdered. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, uh, he, but I think there's a really good chance he could be placed under house arrest. Uh, thankfully, with uh, J.D. Vance, uh, could, could be a, a very effective campaign surrogate on the trail. Uh, but it just underscores the fact that that while Bi Biden has claimed to to fight authoritarian to, a, a war against authoritarianism uh, in Ukraine, in fact, he's been importing here to the U.S. It's uh, I absolutely agree with you. For anyone who had eyes to see, at least for the last two years, it became increasingly clear that Joe Biden is everything that he said he would stand against. I mean, it is an absolute absolute projection project that we have seen going on but this is becoming now so clear that even for foreign policy there's already a transition happening i mean uh orban um um went from kiev to moscow to beijing to washington to attend the nato meeting and immediately to mar-a-lago so he or president trump already has uh, uh, impact on foreign policy and everybody is watching them. The Russians are saying we we don't care who becomes the next president and uh, you know we are not conducting our war depending on U.S. Uh, U.S. electoral cycles. But everybody knows this is this is this is this is crazy. I mean, it depends. This makes a huge change. So everybody's watching this. Um, it, do you have any other indications that the Trump team might already be reaching out to? world leaders in order to kind of uh, uh, increase the chances of of a stable a stable next four or five months absolutely and the trump team has been actively meeting with uh, european leaders in particular um to uh you know kind of uh you know discuss 
uh, what a Trump foreign policy would be to ease ease the fears. Uh, you know, I think it's very strange that uh, NATO leaders, or European leaders, are seem to be very nervous that Trump might end the war. I mean, what could be better for Europe than an end to the war and a res restoration of peace and stability and security? I know, Europe? and David, it pains me to say that, but I we really need the U.S and probably a, a, a Donald Trump to rescue the Europeans from their own boxing themselves in stupidity, because at the moment we really only have two or three responsible leaders, one in Hungary, one in Czechoslovakia, and one maybe on the other side of the Bosporus, uh, who is trying not to get us into a, a global European war. And in this sense, it pains me to say that, but we really depend on the Americans to save us from this war from ourselves. And that includes even the Swiss, although as as usually they 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 try to at least look look properly on paper. Um, do you think that JD Vance is, is, will influence foreign policy um, thinking in the Trump administration or in the in the Trump team uh, from here on forward, or is it other actors within the team that will influence? I think J.D. Vance will be the dominant, uh, you know, advisor to President Trump on foreign policy issues. I think, I think, uh, you know, Vice President Pence did the same thing in the Trump administration, and that's why it seems so bipolar. I mean, the Trump Trump foreign policy was a little bit bipolar during the first term because he would announce, "I'm taking out all of uh, U.S. troops from Syria," and then it wouldn't happen. He announced that twice on Twitter, and and we know now know that Mike Pence and other neoconservatives uh, sabotaged that effort. Uh, Trump wanted to pull out of Afghanistan before the November 2020 election. He was sabotaged with that. Uh, he wanted to pull out of troops out of Iraq, um, and, and so I think um, I think Trump's learned his lesson because you know he he now knows that it was the neoconservative uh, deep state officials that sabotaged his America First uh, conservative agenda, particularly on foreign policy. So you don't think he would do this mistake again? Because it wasn't just uh, Mike Pence. It was also Pompeo, mm -hmm. for, uh, Secretary of State. It was Bolton, the walrus, that was sitting next to him for like one and a half years, or even two years, and whispered in his ear, um, absolutely horrible people. I mean, the worst uh, in terms of uh, peaceful foreign policy. Do you think, or why would, you, why would you think that he will not repeat such mistakes? Because, you know, I mean, you know, there was the Trump-Russia collusion uh, hoax, and that was uh, part of that was uh, involved neoconservatives. Um, just, uh, you know, so many of his initiatives were, uh, you know, were uh, sabotaged or defeated. He was talked out of it, essentially. You know, he is, he is uh, certainly, I mean, he's not a perfect president. He, he was the best president I think we've had since Ronald Reagan, uh, certainly in terms of peace, no new, no new wars. He was very strong against, uh, you know, against uh, ending, you know, the wars in the in the forever wars in the Middle East. Um, but I think, uh, you know, Robert O'Brien, he's he's probably the biggest threat. I think uh, potential Secretary of State. Um, I have an inside source that's uh, friends with him, and the neoconservatives are reportedly backing him as as kind of their their best hope to influence Trump in a neocon direction, particularly on China. Uh, but I don't think they'll be successful on that. Um, but uh, even O'Brien, you know, has stated behind the scenes that he he would like to see the war in Ukraine ended. I think the way he wants it ended is maybe a little different than Trump does. But, uh, you know, there's actually been there was a recent disclosure. Um, I can't remember uh, what uh, what was the, what the news source was. I think it was Axios that reported that um, Fred Flights, who was chief of staff to John Bolton, previously known as a neoconservative, uh, flights was. And then, of course, Keith Kellogg, who was uh, acting national security advisor to Trump uh, just for a, a week or two. Uh, he he had been uh, Pence's uh, national security advisor. They came up with kind of a ceasefire plan in which uh, we would pressure, you know, the Trump administration that came in next year would, would pressure Zelensky to begin peace negotiations with Russia with a permanent ceasefire. Uh, but it doesn't provide any incentive for actual you know, Zelensky to actually uh, agree to a peace agreement with Russia, but it would incentivize them to, uh, for a permanent ceasefire. So that's kind of the baseline. So that I think that's kind of a worst case scenario is we would see a permanent ceasefire and end to the war in Ukraine lasting at least a few years. 
two to four years minimum, uh, hopefully a permanent. Um, and that would kind of allow the U.S. to refocus uh, military uh, deterrence, uh, weapon systems, and, uh, you know, air and naval forces in the Pacific theater, uh, which would be designed to try to deter Taiwan from invading. Um, you know, of course, Trump did, you know, he did uh, pursue a few provocative actions, such as uh, the Taiwan Straits, uh, you know, destroyers and whatnot, uh, sending destroyers in there to uh, kind of poke China in the eye for no reason. You know, uh, this um, freedom of navigation uh, you know, naval naval ships and stuff like that. But uh, for the most part, uh, Trump wanted to get along with China to the extent where he's actually just recently he he uh, said that uh, during his uh, first term that he considered Pre Chinese President Xi Jinping as a very good friend. Uh, he made the weird statement that he, that they were in love, which is kind of you know that's always been a that's something he used with Kim Jong Un as well. Um, but just trying to focus that, you know, the fact that he uh, he wants to have good relations. He described President Xi as a great a great man. Um, I don't agree with any of those statements, uh, but I, I, I admire Trump uh, for supporting peace. I'd rather have him talking you know, good about enemy leaders and not giving up anything in terms of from uh, American national security interests, of course. Uh, but rather to have, you know, peaceful coexistence, which uh, served us so well during the Cold War, you know, where contain containment is what what helped win the Cold War. But also it had it wasn't until it was uh, um, it incorporated peaceful negotiations and arms control agreements and, and bilateral summits uh, that the that helped uh, the Soviet leader uh, Gorbachev uh, collapse the Soviet Union and uh, and, you know, uh, give up the soviet empire so uh that's the kind of you know we have to have peace through strength but a lot of uh you know the neoconservatives don't understand that we have to have peace with military strength it can't be uh you know a confrontation in war yeah you are you're not a a a peacenik who would want to give up the u.s military i mean obviously you have two tanks right behind you but right. you, you are not in favor of projecting force everywhere all the time constantly and and picking all of these fights that have less than a 50 50 chance of of uh of getting you anywhere so the um the question then becomes of course i mean who will be the next president this is not a given but at the moment the one thing to me is a question I have on my mind is for Donald Trump, who's now in a very, very strong position. You know, I think the strongest we can look back at any candidate has had in the past, like comparatively to how weak the other, the other position is. But is are there factions within the Republicans, neocon factions that Donald Trump needs, you know, in order to advance uh, that within within even even to him even to somebody who's as popular as he is and and has a, a consolidated base as, as well as he has that he's there are there still people that he depends on in order to you know uh, go go forward smoothly well i think he uh he wants to have a united party and uh and the biggest sign of that is would be the neoconservative faction that dominates uh at least the leadership of the of uh republican uh Congress, uh, in terms of the House, obviously uh, McConnell, uh, uh, Senate Minority Leader McConnell, who was booed extensively at the convention. He was the only one that that was booed so loudly that no one could could hear what he had to say. Really, so, it was uh, it was that strong the feeling against Mitch McConnell. Yes, yes, no, uh, everyone rejects him. He's the he's the one like the top neoconservative uh, leader of the Republican Party. Of course, there's other reasons that they. They boot him, you know. Of course, he's been uh, never Trump. He's he's kind of behind the scenes supported the Trump impeachments. Um, you know, said a lot of things uh, like that to Trump, uh, even though he endorsed Trump. You know, he he endorsed Trump uh, reluctantly after uh, you know Haley bowed out. Um, so th that was I thought that was very encouraging that the excitement and the support enthusiasm for JD Vance and the opposition of the neocons. Uh, but I would say uh, the only neocons that, that Trump feels he needs are the ones in Congress. And Speaker Johnson, of course, has been very supportive of Trump all along. Uh, so that's kind of the main faction is the House Republicans, because they actually control uh, the House of Representatives.
Right, right. Um, so there's not absolute freedom in what you want to do. There has to be some form of horse trading when it comes to how to make the cabinet um, if he gets elected. You know, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that Trump feels that he needs to compromise with anyone. Uh, so, you know, Trump, of course, was elected in 2016. He was a political neophyte. He'd never never been elected any position, not even uh, city council, like low level positions. And so when he became president, he didn't have um, he didn't really understand how things worked. He he uh, was a little bit naive and that he trusted the uh, the establishment with that we now refer to as the deep state in the Republican Party um, to, uh, you know, that if he if he shared power with the establishment, that they would be loyal to him. And he found out the hard way that uh, that was not the case, that they were continually sabotaging his every move. Everything he tried to do that was conservative, that was America first, uh, anti-globalist, uh, they they tried to sabotage him. And so uh, at this point, you know, he, if he gets elected, um, I don't feel like he he's he will feel like he owes anyone anything, and that he I don't think he he'll feel like he needs to share power with anyone except for his vice president. So uh, I think he's going to have a free hand to, and he'll view any election, even if it's it's by a, a relatively small margin of victory uh, and get a reelected president as a mandate. And so I, I'm not too concerned about that. What's the media landscape like right now? I mean, I read the New York Times and I read Politico and I read, read a couple of these outlets in order to know what the current propaganda thing is. But you, I suppose that you read more of the Republican side of, of publications as well. Um, is, is more realism and anti-war realism starting to seep through on the Republican side of public uh, publications in, in, in mass media in the US, or is that still firmly on war footing? I've seen realism seep through on uh, both on, in conservative media as well as cent uh, more centrist kind of mainstream media, uh, even to some extent in liberal media. Uh, I remember I would come up with ideas such as my sphere of influence agreement that I came, you know, uh, championed in 2019 and various other, you know, of course, my criticisms of the war in Ukraine, and I would do searches online, I would find nothing. I would find like I was the only person that was coming up with this, these kind of ideas. Nowadays, I mean, if I look up opposition to the war in Ukraine, there's a wealth of uh, of articles about that, you know, about why it's foolish to, uh, you know, fight to the last Ukrainian in an unwinnable war against Russia that is so overwhelmingly superior in terms of military and econ 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 economically, industrially, of course, they, uh, in some ways, they outproduce the, the U.S. and uh, the EU combined, in, you know, in terms of uh, one five two millimeter artillery shells. Um, so I'm very encouraged by the shift we've seen towards foreign policy realism. I think that's reflected in terms of the American people. There was a poll, I think it was maybe late 2022, probably early 2023 of Americans. And it, it said that 55% of Americans wanted us to end, end the war in Ukraine and 71% of Republicans. So that's why it was so overwhelming that the whole theme of uh, America first, nationalism, uh, peace through strength, real peace, not the fake peace that neoconservatives claim they support. Um, those were all concepts that received uh, massive popular support at the Republican National Convention. Now, of course, I will say, having attended a number of conventions like that, uh, the activists tend to be much more, a little bit more conservative than uh, Republican voters at large. But still, I think it was quite representative of, of the way Republicans feel in general. There's also this other like super interesting shift happening. Uh, as you said, the Republican Party went from pro peace to pro, uh, from pro war to pro peace party, and they're now becoming the uh, pro workers party. <laughs> Cheney Vance is also a champion of that. And okay, right. the, uh, I think the Republicans haven't really like done away with. Uh, some of the neoliberal discourse of like uh, lower taxes on 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 part on, on the companies and so on, but but they are now very firm on uh, we want import restrictions in order to grow our own uh, own economy in order to pay good salaries to our uh, blue collar workers, which is you know this is this is great that could come straight out of a social democratic party anywhere in Europe. Um, that kind of we need to support the workers. Um, where did that come in and how big do you think that part of the Republican Party now is? 
Well, there was a there was a candidate, presidential candidate I supported back in the 90s, uh, uh, Patrick Buchanan. He, he worked in the Reagan administration and he championed all of these issues. America first, uh, you know, uh, high ter- higher tariffs, uh, you know, jobs for the working class, increasing wages, good manufacturing jobs. These were all issues that that he championed in his 2000 campaign against Donald Trump for the Reform Party nomination. And what happened was, uh, you know, Pat Buchanan went down to his, against to, Donald Trump. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, Donald Trump, actually, his first presidential campaign, granted, it was half hearted. You know, it wasn't a wasn't a, like a full presidential campaign, but he actually did compete for the Reform Party nomination in 2000. He was a different kind of a different candidate. You know, that was be, right before he switched parties to the Democrats. He was much more centrist, perhaps even leftist in many ways. But there were a, a few core. Uh, well, there was at least one issue that he has never changed on that. That is, uh, you know, restoring um, America's manufacturing kind of defense industrial base, uh, good jobs for the working class. Those are things that he's always championed. And it was something that that um, his rifle at the time, Patrick Buchanan, um, championed. And uh, and President Trump pretty much took uh, Pat Buchanan's uh, campaign agenda and made it his own in 2016. So that we no longer remember Pat Buchanan, uh, all of those those issues, you know, we, we think of uh, in, instinctively of President Trump. So but President Trump is, in you know, in, uh, in all candidates, uh, he has championed the working class in all three of his presidential campaigns since in 2016 and 2020 and 2024. He uh, I think it was the last campaign. He talked a lot about the, the forgotten man, the forgotten woman, you know, the. Uh, uh, the working class, uh, you know, manufacturing job folks that, that lost their jobs because of NAFTA. That was kind of a huge theme during this uh, Republican National Convention that I attended last week. And so all of those issues are th- those were traditionally Republican issues. You know, during the Eisenhower years, we were, you know, we supported tariffs. Strong, It was right there in the platform. We supported, uh, you know, moderate revenue based tariffs to keep manufacturing here at home. And then somehow. Uh, probably beginning in the mid to late 80s, uh, we began to become embrace globalism, you know, embrace this idea that, you know, unilateral free trade with China, like we would have low trade barriers, but they could have high trade and and somehow that would benefit us. And, and uh, when, in fact, it strained our wealth, it's reduced our real wages and it's really hurt the working class and the lower middle class that, uh, you know, that Trump has prioritized, uh, the, that the Democrat Party has really forgotten as they've become the party of the elites and the the, the billionaires and the uh, multimillionaires. So uh, you're right. You're absolutely right. You know, in some ways, uh, the Republican Party is it resembles uh, uh, the Social Democrats of Europe in, in that way. It's 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 an amazing shift, you know. And people who still think in in left and right and black and white uh, uh, terminologies, they cannot wrap their head around all of the stuff that's changing, and then they start misinterpreting. Because they they look at they they think of this stuff as, as 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 static, but obviously the Republican Party right now is having its big renewal from 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 the inside. The Democrats try to portray that as an evil takeover of an authoritarian who wants to grab power, and therefore we need to use lawfare in order to get rid of him. And <laughs> but uh, okay, let's just suppose people are not dumb. Luckily, a, a large a large proportion of the of the general public actually does see through this the question now will be um what's the other side going to do so um do you think that the democrats have a chance of getting out of that absolute mess that they maneuvered themselves into um and what's the what's the talk in, in around around your area what 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 will they try to do to sell to to rescue this one yeah, well, as you alluded to in the New York Post, uh, you know, they came out with an article that exposed the fact that the it was the Democrat, you know, top Democrat party bosses that pushed that forced uh, Biden to uh, to resign. I mean, he did so under protest, kicking and screaming. Uh, this was not an act of patriotism. Uh, he was yeah. he was literally threatened with the 25th Amendment that he would be, uh, you know, that Kamala and cabinet officials would would force him out of office. And so. Uh, he reluctantly finally agreed after, uh, you know, three and a half months of uh, blackmail or three and a half weeks of blackmail since the uh, uh, the debate, the presidential debate that he, uh, you know, famously, uh, you know, just got wiped out and uh, and, you know, stuttered and, and couldn't put two sentences together. 
Um, but I think uh, so. I think the Republic, or rather, the Democrat Party, has really come behind Kamala Harris. Just in the last uh, 36 hours, she's been endorsed by all of her potential uh, Democrat Party rivals. Uh, the only three uh, major Democrats that have not endorsed her at this point are uh, President, former President Barack Obama. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries, who's the House Minority Leader, and then Senate Major uh, Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer. So she is going to go into the convention uh, as the presumptive nominee. There have been rumors that uh, Mark Kelly might be recruited to run against her. But I think that's just going to be a show to, to pretend that it's a, it's an open convention when, in fact, uh, it's quite rigged. You know, uh, 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 Trump's, Trump has, has long said that the Democrats rig their elections it's not just the general elections they rig, they rig the primaries as well. Now, of course, in fairness, uh, Trump Trump tried to do the same thing, you know, of course, with uh, recent conventions. And he didn't have to rig anything, you know, because he, he would have won overwhelmingly either way. He's the most popular uh, conservative figure in the Republican Party. Uh, but I think uh, Kamala is uh, likely to, uh, he, she very well might pick Mark Kelly, who's the senator from Arizona. He's a, a former U.S. Navy captain, so a senior former uh, Navy officer, uh, former astronaut. Um, and, uh, you know, if he runs against her, he'll be presented as kind of the, the, uh, the second uh, most vote, highest vote getter. And, and so he'll be the log logical pick and he'll be a strong, uh, you know, support for her. Uh, but, you know, there's a poll that came out just today uh, that showed her nine points behind in a, in a, a race with, with Trump and, and third party um, candidates. So, She's got a lot of ground to make up. And uh, I think the Democrats, uh, you know, every intention of stealing this election, I think they stole uh, the last presidential election, 2020. And so, uh, you know, they can do that through voting algorithms. They can do it through illegal immigrants. There's been a huge drive in the U.S. Uh, against voter ID. You know, uh, Trump's feeling has always been to adopt the French model for elections, which is uh, voter ID, same day voting, a national holiday. Uh, no mail-in ballots uh, to to uh, you know to ensure that uh, that our Republican ideals are included and our Democratic voting uh, traditions are are maintained. Uh, but the Democrats have been at war with democracy, you know, on, on so many levels, uh, with the authoritarianism, the lawfare, uh, the uh, drive against uh, uh, election integrity. And so I think I think unfortunately, I mean, while Trump is going to win every poll, I I, I don't. I don't think he's going to lose his lead. I think his lead is, you know, is going to go down a little bit after the Democrat National Convention. But I wouldn't be surprised if Trump was six points ahead, uh, you know, on the polling average, if at least five or six points ahead on Election Day. And if the Democrats steal that, um, you know, and if they steal, you know, five, even five percent of the votes, um, I think it's going to be it could could cause some violence in this country. And, and uh, you know, not civil war on the scale we've seen before, but but massive civil strife as people will know that the election was stolen uh, because it's never been stolen um, by more than 3.2% uh, um, in terms of the real clear politics average, which are all both parties believe is is kind of the, the gold standard for uh, for polling, a polling company. It's really, it's, it's really quite amazing that Actually, a lot of U.S. presidential elections are contested on one level or another. And, you know, the it just go back to 2000 and the one between Al Gore and and um, George Bush Jr. And so you're absolutely right. It is it is anything but clear who will be in the end, uh, who will be carrying the torch and, and, and make it <laughs> make it through the finishing line um, officially on and. and um, Unofficially, and this is a huge problem, right? Because whether or not it's rigged, just if one of the two sides accuses the other one of it ha of having rigged it and keeping the lid on it uh, with information, then you already have any everything you need for for massive civil strife. Because the same could be done by the other side, right? Let's say Donald Trump wins, and then the Democrats start crying foul and say, like, you you cheated, you cheated. We have uh, un a deniable proof. We have 51 former uh, security officers, uh, security officers, sorry, uh, secret service uh, uh, chiefs who all said this was rigged and this you were helped by Russia and Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping and and the Iranians and you're an you're an enemy of the of the state, which is not. I mean, I could imagine some uh, scenario like that. That would also be hugely dangerous, right? Um, do you think 
do you think the Democrats would accept the defeat or try to resort to such kind of uh, smearing tactics? So my greatest fear during the uh, November 2020 presidential election was that uh, Trump would win only by by a, a very slight margin. And then the Democrats would, uh, the far left uh, uh, rioters would take to the street and burn down the cities because, you know, obviously during the George, George Floyd riots, uh, you know, even on May 30th, 2020, uh, they, they assaulted the White House. Uh, they tried to uh, to lynch President Trump to the to the extent that the White House had to turn off the lights for the first time ever, I think. And, uh, you know, the sni uh, Secret Service snipers took positions as the, the first uh, White House barrier was was breached. And uh, Trump and his family, his, uh, you know, his wife and his son were, were pushed down into the uh, the underground section of the White House uh, just for their own personal protection, pushed and shoved. And, and Trump never forgot. I mean, he didn't he didn't forget that uh, for some time. He may he may that's probably not a fresh memory in his mind now, but. He was very angry about that, that his wife and son, uh, son's safety were compromised by the far left protesters. Uh, but I think it's it's uh, almost inevitable that if Trump were to win, even if he were like won a large majority of the legal votes, but uh, Democrat fraud made it look really close, like he barely took barely won. Uh, the Democrats would most certainly take the streets, start burning cities um, I mean, there's there's no telling what could happen, but it, it, it would certainly be as bad as the 2020 um, uh, George Floyd riots during, yeah, during the summer. Very tough and kind of unhappy things to think about. And I'm just realizing while talking to you that now that we are in this situation of U.S. politics, it's everything is becoming a guessing game, like foreign policy included. There's just no more no more certainty about who is doing what uh, over the next over the next half a year. Um, do you have any more any more things on your mind that you would like to to put out there, in, especially in terms of foreign policy of how you're seeing that? Well, Ukraine, China, Iran um, might might or are now developing in this new context of U.S. policy. Well, I think China, uh, probably the most significant thing I can talk about is, is I think, uh, as I mentioned, Chinese leaders uh, view Biden as kind of a window of vulnerability, uh, you know, because Biden, of course, was compromised by uh, his family, received 31 million from uh, Chinese companies that are, were connected to Chinese military intelligence. And so I think uh, I think uh, they, they actually fear Trump might be a harsher president against them. Certainly on trade, he would be, but not militarily. And I don't know, I don't think they fully understand that. So I think uh, they will likely, if indeed they're planning on, uh, you know, blockading and, and or invading Taiwan, which I believe, strongly believe they they plan to do. I think they'll uh, they'll do so in, in October, in the October, November timeframe, um, which is gonna be right before the election. Um, I think it's gonna it's gonna be a blockade. They're gonna probably try to probably avoid an invasion uh, with a you know the idea that a blockade could uh, kind of uh, force Taiwan to capitulate within a matter of weeks, uh, perhaps as little as two three weeks. Uh, because if uh, you know if, ta if that were to occur and and the the U.S. didn't um, make a move to try to breach the blockade, uh, some kind of military move. Um, I think Taiwan would realize that uh, there was really no point in resisting, and uh, they they choose to uh, accept forcible reunification. But uh, as you know, I've come up with a plan that's uh, uh, does, it's uh, kind of an EU style confederation reunification plan, which would preserve a high, a very high level of uh, Taiwanese uh, self rule and autonomy uh, as part of a Chinese confederation with Communist China. And uh, would also preserve uh, their control of uh, of the, their military forces, but it would uh, put uh, you know Taiwan squarely in the Chinese sphere of influence and cut all military ties with with the U.S. I think that would be an acceptable solution on the Chinese side, despite the fact that they they've said essentially no compromise is acceptable. We want full reunification. Um, I think they would view that as a stepping stone towards full reunification that would be acceptable in the, in the interim. Uh, that could certainly avoid uh, a full-scale war between the U.S. and China, which which would threaten the whole world. I don't know what the thinking in Beijing is. It's just 
clear that the only red line they have is an is an independent is a declaration of independence from Taiwan. So in the absence of that, the status quo has served both of these polities quite well. Um, and let's not forget, China is the largest trading partner of Taiwan, and despite despite their existential fights on both sides, they have managed to have a relationship with each other. So that is something I would say, like, if you just leave it there, <laughs> we have we have good um, we have good reasons to believe that um, no major catastrophe will happen. But um, we'll see about that. Um, David, people can find well, you on Substack, right? That's the, your main channel. Yes, the real war dpyne dot substack dot com is my is my website. Yeah. And I'd also like, if you don't mind, I'd like to briefly uh, discuss my my uh, peace plan for Ukraine. If you... Oh, peace, please. Yes, sure. Yeah, so I recently published a 10-point uh, peace plan for uh, Ukraine just uh, on July 13th. I was just finishing up, uh, getting ready to publish it as, as news of the shooting came uh, came in against Donald Trump. But essentially, uh, you know, um, what I think, I, I think the problem has been, you know, like uh, the Biden administration, their focus is keeping Ukraine, is getting Russia to recognize that Ukraine should remain a U.S. military ally, uh, whereas uh, Russia simply wants uh, all U.S. and NATO troops out of Ukraine. Um, I think that's really a, a bigger goal than, uh, you know, than, than neutrality. You know, they, they focused on neutrality. But if you look at, uh, at how they've responded to NATO expansion, uh, it's not that they had a huge problem with NATO expansion in itself. It's that they they didn't want to have any NATO uh, troops or infrastructure or bases, particularly nuclear capable weapon systems deployed in um, in the former Warsaw Pact or former Soviet republics. Uh, so what uh, what I've changed in this the, this new peace plan is um, Ukraine would uh, would become essentially a, a non NATO ally of the West. Uh, so they would commit to never join NATO. Uh, wouldn't be neutral, but they would uh, they would have um, uh, they would have to disarm militarily to the level of Germany. You know, uh, a lot of people don't realize the German military is is not very strong. It's it's pretty weak right now. Uh, they have a large number of um, armored vehicles, uh, certainly a lot more than Russia would like to see in Ukraine. But in terms of tanks, they have uh, much less um, uh, tanks than Ukraine. Probably have more aircraft and ships. Um, but uh, in general, in terms of weapon systems, I think the uh, the level of the German military would be a useful barometer uh, in terms of capping Ukrainian weapon systems to a level that uh, Russia would find acceptable. Uh, Russia has stated they they want to have uh, Ukraine's military uh, reduced to fifty percent of the level of of uh, in terms of active duty troops uh, before uh, that existed before the war before the invasion began. Uh, but then. Beyond that, um, I think it's really important to have, uh, you know, to have an agreement be more comprehensive that would uh, include Russia in, in the security infrastructure of Europe. And the way we could do that is by uh, kind of reci uh, reciprocal agreements and provisions to to this uh, this peace agreement, in which the U.S. would withdraw all its troops from Eastern Europe. That's part of really part of the Trump plan, reportedly to re restructure NATO. Um, we could even, as I mentioned, I think previously, we could uh, pull out um, all of our nuclear weapons from Western Europe um, while keeping uh, NATO under a, a, the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Uh, currently, we only have 150 gravity bombs. Uh, those, I think, should, would be better served to be transferred to the Western Pacific, uh, uh, fleet carriers, aircraft carriers. Um, and then we would have um, almost kind of a sphere of influence agreement uh, where we would have... Um, we would essentially, um, you know, agree to not have any military relations or arms shipments to former Soviet republics outside of, of course, of the Baltics, which are NATO members. And Russia could promise the same thing for uh, for the Western Hemisphere and obviously for NATO as well. And the goal, uh, the goal of my peace agreement is essentially to build, um, kind of build upon the uh, Anglo-French, uh, you know, um, entente cordiale. Uh, model, which is it was in 1904, you know, these two uh, implacable enemies, seemingly uh, Britain and France that, you know, were only briefly allies, I think, during the Crimean War, you know, pretty much been fighting each other for centuries. 
and uh, they decided to to uh, set up kind of a sphere of influence agreement uh, to uh, ensure that they would not go to, to war again. Uh, they didn't become allies, of course, till 1914, uh, on the eve of, uh, just after World War One began. Uh, but um, uh, to have this kind of, you know, more than simply a detente, but actually have a, a kind of a, a Russo-American entente that could could be used as kind of a kind of a grand strategic partnership for peace that, that I've uh, you know wrote about in, in national interest uh, a few years ago. Uh, that would end the end the, the Cold War with Russia. It would eliminate the Russian military threat to uh, uh, both conventional nuclear to Europe as well as the nuclear threat to the U.S. And uh, it would essentially uh, neutral serve to neutralize uh, the Sino-Russian military alliance, uh, so that China would no longer uh, have reason to believe that Russia would back it militarily in the event of uh, of a war with the U.S. over Taiwan. And uh, Another another kind of provision that I included in the agreement is is kind of a new uh, you know reinsurance treaty you know the reinsurance treaty between Germany and Russia uh, uh, of 1887, uh, which essentially prevented you know as long as it was in force it prevented the uh, the Franco-Russian alliance from from forming uh, before Kaiser Wilhelm II uh, foolishly broke out of that. Uh, but that's the kind of agreement I think we could have with Russia where we could we could agree that. In the event either country was attacked by a third, third, uh, a third party, a third, uh, another power, that uh, you know that that uh, uh, the other country would not go to war against against uh, against us. So, for example, in the case of China were to attack the U.S., which um, is is possible, uh, then Russia would remain would pledge to remain neutral. So, I, I think that would be be a good model for for the way forward. I think that would accomplish, you know, Trump's desire to end the war in 24 hours, uh, but go much farther than that and have this comprehensive peace that I think he actually supported in 2016, yeah. but was prevented from uh, implementing due to the Trump-Russia uh, collusion hoax. And, you know, the last thing that you just proposed is neutrality clauses. They were, they used to be extremely popular in the 19th century, and actually they're coming back. Did you did you look at the, the treaty between North Korea and Russia? They include that clause. They've got it in there, and of course, it's a clause aimed at China. Um, if, if I didn't realize that. If anyone, if if any one of the two ever has a problem with a third state, then the other party will not will not join uh, that third state against the other party. It's exactly what they say. Yeah. So um, the Russians, the Russians understand this game very clearly, and I'm I'm pretty sure they're pragmatic enough to say like, yeah, if the U.S. comes back as a diplomatic actor and not just as a as a shooting crazy uh, 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 maniac, then they would probably be willing to to think about new deals. And um, you're right, this would impact the situation with um, with China. Um, although I'm pretty sure also the BRICS and so on will continue. And this um, the one thing that that is thoroughly clear now is that um, relying on a world that runs purely on US controlled infrastructure, global finance and so on infrastructure is, is uh, not a good bet for the others. So they will, um, this, this all, building up alternative structures will certainly continue, but the US within that new environment can definitely be one of the, will be one of the three or so biggest players. So, um, question what, what will happen out of that. Uh, I think your peace plan has, has great potential because it contains all of the important, the realist aspects. Um, and people can read about that on The Real War um, by David Pine. David, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to be on the show.